Hello and welcome to Talk the Walk. I'm Azam Khan. Hong Kong has been on the receiving end of a doomsday narrative by Western media for the last few years, fueled by matching rhetoric by some UK and other Western officials, and that did not slow down in 2022. It comes at a time when Hong Kong is trying to tell its story and China's story to the world, something which government officials have been echoing and encouraging regularly. My guest today has been trying to do just that with his online platform. He's a longtime journalist and author based in Hong Kong who has combined his experience and passions for the purpose of conveying Hong Kong, its history, its people, its culture to the English speaking world. He's managing editor of Friday Culture Limited, a Hong Kong based media outlet, Nuri Vitachi. Mr. Vitachi, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you very much, as I'm great to be here. Uh, Hong Kong's status as a financial hub has been undermined uh, repeatedly by numerous Western officials um, and media outlets including a recent report by the UK government, uh, which blanket labeled um, and attacked Hong Kong's status and its freedoms. Um, then you also have campaigns by former Governor Chris Patton. Um, but then at the same time, you have Hong Kong joining like the largest trading bloc, the RCEP. So and all of this happening while the mainland border is just now opening up. So things can start can finally get going economically. So how do how do you how do both of these realities exist? Um, in the narrative, you know, I, I've met many of these uh, these, these British uh, anti Hong Kong people. You know, Chris Patton and uh, uh, Benedict Rogers and them, and uh, they really come across to me as like old colonialists who who can't let go. You know, it's sort of like their attitude is when we ruled the place. You know, it was splendid. The natives drank gin tea and worshipped the queen, but now. Now the natives are running the place themselves and it's gone to pot. You know, they're, they're really like, they make me want to just um, just turn them off. You know, when people send me links saying, uh, you know, Chris Patton or the, the British uh, uh, APG, the British Parliamentary Group on Hong Kong has, has uh, released a new document. You know what I do? I just flick it off my phone. I don't even read it anymore because um, it's, the old imperialists mm. trying to hang on to their colony. Stay relevant. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So uh, I mean, I'll tell you my secret. Uh, I, I sneak off from wherever I am. You know, FCC, Foreign Correspondents Club, no, thank you. Uh, I go off to the business community, go off to Exchange Square, because uh, their people, uh, their jobs depend on getting it right. So they look at what's really happening and they look at what's coming up. So, um, and uh, as I say, they're, they're looking after other people's money and they're investing it. So they have to get it right. So that means politics. They have to ignore the politics because um, politics might say this or that. Doesn't matter what's really happening. That's what the business community needs to know. So um, despite the fact that journalists are uh, supposed to be dealers in information, I often find that the real story can be found uh, with the business community, not the journalists. Right. And you, you're someone who's been in that world. You know, you've worked for the SCMP and the Standard and just a number of different outlets. You've been in that world for decades. What were the, what were the, uh, when did you notice these? Uh, what were some changing points uh, over the years of, of noticing this sort of echo chamber or yeah, for lack of a better word? Yeah, I mean the 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 English language media has always had a bit of a, a sort of Western lens, but um, I think now these days, you know, people are more woke, more politically correct, and uh, we start to realise. Wait a minute, you know, we're seeing everything from one point of view. I mean, just to give you, uh, you know, I'm a numbers man. I love numbers. Uh, just to give you a point of view, the the UK is zero point eight seven percent of the world. Right. So what does it matter what they think of, of Hong Kong or China? I'm sorry, guys, it doesn't matter. You know, mm -hmm. the you know, Bangladesh is what two to two percent of the world. Um, Indonesia is probably three or four percent of the world. You know, so um, we need to look at things from an Asian point of view. You know, the US and the UK together probably make up maybe 5% of the world. Uh, I'm interested, what does the other 95% of the world think? Why should all our newspapers, all our media be filled with what that 5% say about our city and our country, and not what the 95% 
uh, say. So sorry, US and UK, you know, you're small fry, you're small fry compared to the rest right. of the world. And you've had the world stage for too long. It's right. time for the rest of us to stand up and see things from our point of view. I think perhaps a lot of that stems from, you know, years of just not understanding, not Hong Kong, but not understanding the mainland China, Chinese mainland and China as a whole. So I think it probably, would you say that it stems from that and and as a result, there's been a lack of uh, balance and having journalists from there, from China, and stories being told from China. And is that what you're doing with Friday Every Day, just sort of breaking that barrier and telling stories and um, sort of bridging that? Uh, that's right. Yes, that's right. We're coming from a from a from a different angle. So, for example. Um, instead of getting into some sort of polarized fight, there's too much polarization going on. Uh, we choose a, a different route. So, for example, uh, we wrote an article about um, John Lennon and the fact that his biggest song, Imagine, uh, was based on the Communist Manifesto. You know, a lot of people don't know this, and it's not. It's not. Uh, recorded in uh, write-ups about John Lennon, but you know we've got a photograph of him reading the Communist Manifesto, and then eventually goes off to his white piano and writes um, writes the song Imagine. So we thought, okay, that's a funny angle, and it will get people thinking. So it's all about getting people thinking. I think. Right, but you know you have uh, outlets like the closing of Stan News, um, Apple Daily News, and then critics and the, the journalists that you were uh, referring to, they would they would call this the disappearance of journalism in Hong Kong. So what do you say to that? <laughs> oh, yeah, that one makes me laugh, yeah. So uh, when a journalist says to me, uh, a foreign journalist says to me, um, oh, journalism, I read that journalism had been wiped out in Hong Kong. I say, mm, meet me for breakfast. And then I walk him past the, uh, the newspaper queue outside my office, which is literally a quarter of a kilometre long. And it's one of four queues for to pick up the newspapers every morning in my district and there are queues like this all over the place hong kong has always been the world's like number one consumer of newspapers it's been like that for decades and it's still like that today uh, there are like 15 uh, daily papers in hong kong and uh, they're still lively and you can still see them criticizing the government regularly i mean there's some columnists that hate the government and then the the ace in the hole uh, I take these foreign journalists and I show them the website called Nine Gag. Now, this is a, a supposedly a comedy meme website. In fact, it's incredibly unfunny. Uh, it's a bit like 4chan. It's just sort of like rather crude, racist and sexist uh, uh, jokes and things. But it's a Hong Kong website. It's founded uh, in Hong Kong. And um, it's full of very anti-China stuff, uh, the, the 4chan community hates the Hong Kong government, hates the Chinese government, and says so very loudly and very offensively. Uh, and there's plenty of examples like this. So Hong Kong journalism uh, is, is alive and well. And yes, you are allowed to criticize the government. So there's plenty of examples uh, of this. You know, That's it takes two seconds to look it up on the Internet. That's true. People really forget that what a newspaper reading city we still are and then one of the highest uh, um, numbers of media outlets per per capita, I would say, in the world. That's true. Um, Chief Executive John Lee said the other day that there's been some who've been using journalism uh, to cover political purposes, laundering money, et cetera. And obviously, there's been cases of that with uh, money sources being linked to the NED, um, UK-backed groups towards funds that, you know, that backed some uh, segments of the unrest. Um, so what are your thoughts on all of that? And Chief Executive said also that the national security law has helped to clear some of this out, but there's more work to do. So what are your thoughts on that? There have always been spies in, uh, in journalism. Uh, I remember my father telling me, my father was a journalist in Hong Kong uh, 50 years ago. Um, and he, uh, 60 years ago even, uh, and uh, he ended up working with with the CIA and he suddenly realized, what? And, uh, uh, you know, it was a shock to him, but, uh, uh, you know, his colleagues turned out to be CIA people. Uh, that was in the 60s, late 60s. Uh, in, in the 70s, there was a big clear out. I remember in 77, I think it was, the New York Times did a survey and found 700 um, intelligence people working in the Western media uh, and so on. I remember mm, I was working for an Asian weekly magazine and our Tokyo correspondent 
was never available. He was always too busy to do his actual job. And then one day he said, uh, look, I'm really working for the CIA. This is just my cover. So don't expect me to do all this stuff for you. And eventually he resigned and uh, uh, we, we assigned his work to a, to a real journalist. But there's always been CIA people, uh, military intelligence people in journalism, in Western journalism, in Asia and in Hong Kong, always, always. Right. Far East Economic Review, it was like an open secret, their connections to British intelligence. So, um, so yes, there are there have always been spies in journalism here and there still are today. I can I can guarantee that. Right. But I would say, like, even though Hong Kong has been on the receiving end, um, by certain officials and rhetoric, it's overall it's there's been a, a a large drop in the in the interest from mainstream media compared to 2019 when it was just nonstop every day, and one you know one particular narrative, one uh, particular side being shown, whether it's through the police force in Hong Kong or um, the liberties falling apart. Um, but now it's that's all of that is gone. All of that is just not being covered. Yeah, that's right. So um, just a couple of days ago, there was a report that uh, 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 police, uh, lethal police uh, violence in the U.S. has reached a new record high. And um, yet you look back or you do a search on Google, and you look up police violence and, you know, Hong Kong police pop up, which is absurd. Hong Kong police are the least violent in the world, um, you know, during six months of rioting. They killed literally nobody. And uh, in in that period, um, there were protests of a similar nature all over the world. And those protests resulted in, in many people being killed by the police, you know, in France uh, or, in, or in Chile or in, uh, in the Middle East, in, in, in many places. Um, but, yeah, the narrative that Hong Kong is being destroyed by the new uh, bosses, that's kind of uh, faded away a bit because uh, they established it well in 2019. And the Western media have moved on to, to other topics, not interested in us now that we're peaceful and happy. I need to pause you right there while we step away for a quick break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after the break with Nuri Vitachi. Welcome back to Talk the Walk. I'm speaking with Nuri Vitachi, Managing Editor of Friday Culture Limited. Uh, Mr. Vitachi, I wanted to talk to you about why you decided to um, help start Friday Culture. And after a long career of journalism and being an author in the city, um, what is particularly different about this, this step and its mission? Well, I didn't really start it. It was really uh, in uh, early 2021. Um, there was a, a, a well-known Hong Kong uh, guy called Herman Hu. His family is well-known for sponsoring uh, sports events uh, in Hong Kong, both in the British era and in the in the modern era. And um, he was frustrated by all the polarization. Now, he owns a few bars, and he was in one of the bars, and he realized that on Friday nights, people talked about all sorts of things. But because it was a Friday, the attitude was different. And people, you know, talked through issues and they were they were cool with it. So he thought, OK, we want to not join in the polarized battle. We want to do something a bit different. So uh, he launched this group, Friday Culture. And uh, our website is, is FridayEveryday.com uh, to, to do this. And, uh, you know, mutual friends introduced us and it just fitted with me so well because I've always uh, disliked politics in the pure sense and preferred to commentate using satire and sarcasm being and, facetious uh, yeah <laughs> that's yeah, right that's right facetious me <laughs> <laughs> yes. right that's a, that's a, yeah that's the sense i get you know whenever when i read um the content on your platform playful humor filled um and it's very on brand with you and I think it's refreshing, and it's, but it's, it's very interesting balance that you have to strike, especially when you do touch on serious issues and um, sharing a perspective which may not always be um, you know, liked and supported by the mainstream narrative. So how do you balance that? Yeah. <clears throat> You know, we don't, we're, fortunately, because we're not like a newspaper or a newspaper record, we don't have to comment on everything that comes out. We don't have to report everything that comes out. We're more like a magazine, like a Friday magazine, where we can uh, pick and choose what we comment on. So um, uh, 
you know, I tend to uh, avoid the very contentious issues, you know, there are so many people in the world talking about Ukraine, for example, or the pandemic, you know, don't need another voice talking about that. Uh, instead, we provide a, a different service. So, for example, you know, we did an article on uh, on Justice Pao. Judge Pao is, Hong, is China's Sherlock Holmes. Mm. And... Um, uh, he was a real character. And that article has been so popular uh, around the world. So just offbeat, uh, different sort of things. Um, we, we we like numbers. So we discovered that, did you know, Hong Kong women are more likely to marry younger men than women from anywhere else. For some reason, Hong Kong women uh, go for younger men and, and uh, marry them. So... Right. That's interesting, isn't it? So we find interesting offbeat things and uh, uh, get people just relaxed. You know, we call this Zen journalism. We're not really pushing politics. We're just being very gentle and laid back. We do it through videos or, or articles or uh, or even talks or one-to-one -one meetings. Right. And you guys do focus, it's interesting, you focus on English, you know, the English speaking world, English, it's English based, obviously. And that's usually where you tend to find the, the misunderstandings, um, the, the lack of uh, awareness and knowledge on, you know, on things that, like that fact you pointed out about Hong Kong women. Um, so can you just talk about the, uh, the, the importance of that? Like there is that sort of tale of two worlds in Hong Kong, like the English speaking world and then um, those who may not, you know, receive news normally from their sources. Um, that share a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, um, for example, uh, you know, I was at a dinner party recently and uh, someone said, well, China can never have uh, the rule of law because, you know, Chinese officials cannot be arrested. Uh, uh, you know, the party is above uh, the law. So, um, you know, instead of getting into some political argument, I just, you know, very gently said, um, Actually, do you know that uh, the Chinese officials are arrested every day? The latest China uh, corruption campaign has ensnared 4.7 million officials. 4.7 million officials. And they said, really? And, you know, I can easily show them articles about, you know, the number of corruption arrests because, you know, China's having a massive corruption uh, crackdown over the last few years. And people think, oh, it's interesting. And, you know, this was a dinner party with a lot of, you know, different people from different nationalities. And you could see them just listening and hearing and their brains going click, click, click. Well, that's not what I heard. Mm -hmm. And so gently, gently, you persuade people that, uh, you know, perhaps what they're hearing is not a full picture of what's going on uh, in this yeah. region. Yeah, I think the protests, you know, of the COVID lockdown protests that you see in China, that also in a similar way bamboozled people. Like I thought there were no protests that happened in China, but then when they see it now and when people talk about it, then it's like, oh, you know, then it, it goes back to that. Uh, it's paradigm shifting for them. Um, right. But can you talk about like, obviously, the retelling Hong Kong story has been a big priority for the government, um, both the central government and the, the local one, the city one. Um, so can you just talk about the importance of that, especially going forward, especially in this climate um, as the, the, the rivalry between the United States and China and there is a sort of jostling for narrative control, which we've seen um, just for an example um, for Biden's Build Back Better uh, plan, which is supposed to counter the One Belt, One Road. A lot of that money has been allocated towards nurturing and building up journalism there to help tell a certain perspective. Uh, seemingly like a U.S. perspective and one that is directed towards China. So can you just talk about the importance of this, tel the, this importance of telling Hong Kong story and Chinese story uh, to, the, to the world and the English-speaking world? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I mean, uh, one, one of the things uh, we do is just show Hong Kong as it is. So uh, a lot of our filming is out in Hong Kong, in, you know, in Central or in Causeway Bay or wherever, just uh, showing, look, Hong Kong is full of happy people. It's not like you expect. I and mean, there's a hilarious piece in the Sunday Times of UK uh, a few weeks ago, which was sort of like, a journalist penetrates Hong Kong, the first journalist to arrive in a besieged city, you know, and it was just hilarious. It was like a sort of war zone story. Absurd. Uh, so, you know, we, we just uh, show Hong Kong as it really is. And uh, 
I think telling that uh, that positive story is, um, it, you know, it's. I mean, the, the good thing is that people in the West are actually becoming quite sceptical. Just last week, they, they released the Edelman Trust Barometer, an annual report going on for 20 years of trust in the media. And guess what? China came, tr came top. Uh, people of China trust their media, trust their government. And who came bottom? Yes, the US, the UK, and countries which are allied to them, like Japan and South Korea. These people don't trust their media. These people are very skeptical about what they've been told. So even Western people are skeptical about their media. And then right now, this this uh, this afternoon, there's uh, there's been a Twitter discussion going on, and I'm involved in it. And lots of interesting, much more famous people than me, like Elon Musk and uh, Kim.com. And the discussion is basically, what happened to the Western media? Why did it lose its uh, its integrity? It used to speak truth to power, but it's all gone. What happened to it? You know, and this is a huge discussion on Twitter with lots of famous people on it. So there's a general acknowledgement that you can no longer trust the Western media. Right. And, uh, you know, that's good. It's good for yeah, us. That's true. That's true. There is a lot of that, um, that breaking of that barrier <laughs> happening, which you see with Elon Musk and Twitter and his sort of uh, clashes with the mainstream institutions. Um, so it's nice to see you take part of that, take part in that with him on Twitter. Uh, but you know, but there has been, you know, Hong Kong is reeling. There's, there are people, a lot of people who had left the city and um, it's, we're coming out of COVID and just a lot of hurt and just still the, the, the hangover of the, um, the unrest and all of that. So um, talk about how, you know, the, the content that you guys put out now helps to sort of just bring up everybody's spirits again and bring up the the joy and the spirit of Hong Kong. Right. I mean, Hong Kong is such a it's such a great place with uh, with so many cool things happening and 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 also China itself. Um, so, for example, we'll put out an article saying that uh, uh, China makes more uh, electric vehicles, electric vehicle batteries and stuff than, than all the rest of the countries in the world uh, put together. And people are interested in, in fighting climate change. So that's, uh, they, you know, that gets a lot of clicks. Um, we found out that uh, China had recently planted a forest as big as as big as a country, literally, you know, as big as say Belgium. Um, you know, that's a lot of reforestation. So there's a lot of really interesting positive news that doesn't make it to the West, right. and so it's it's all there for us. Nuri Vitachi, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Azam. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you the same time next week. Goodbye.